This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time. Uh, Tim Allman here. Jack Kalberg has a day off. Uh, today, I'm getting the privilege of sitting down with Mae Keller. Let me tell you about Mae Keller. Uh, she was the Director of Institutional Effectiveness at Concordia University <laughs> Ann Arbor uh, up into the year 2018. You had about a 10-year run in that role, correct, Mae? Uh, 20, 2011, actually. To 18. 2011. Okay, but about seven years there. Uh, She's been actively involved in trying to, uh, with many people, including Michigan District President uh, Dave Davis, kind of save Concordia University Ann Arbor, um, especially since Dr. Ankerberg's announcement town hall in February. Uh, That was a very, very difficult town hall to be sure. She has attended all of the town halls to date. She's also not a member of a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregation, which I believe gives her more objectivity in this conversation. She can share a little bit more of her background in in corporate America too, before taking that role. Uh, She told me that being with Concordia University Ann Arbor, and shout out to Ryan Peterson and others who were there during that time was uh, the greatest work experience of her lifetime after years in secular America. Her her job was quality management, performance improvement with a lot of data analysis. And she came out of the healthcare healthcare world. Uh, she also is familiar with accreditation. She helped build the management system there at Concordia University, Ann Arbor, working closely with Dr. Ferry uh, during that time. And, uh, and she's become, over time, uh, good friends with, with Tammy Ferry as well. And a number of people told me we should, we should chat, and I'm excited to do so. But maybe before we get in, May, um, I just want to make this general statement. I've been uh, leading podcast conversations, praying for open dialogue, disagreeing agreeably. Um, let's come together with diverse perspectives and and talk. Again, it's been hard, and I understand why in this case. It's been hard to maybe have a conversation with Dr. Ankerberg, and there's been a lot of non-disclosure agreements as, as they've been trying to figure a lot of this thing out. Before we get into some of the, the details, leadership is hard. So for you, Dr. Ankerberg, for uh, you, uh, Dr. Hardy with Concordia University System now, Concordia University, the CUS, I understand the complexity of leading in in higher ed this day and age. Um, I also understand the dance that has been taking place. I've been to the last three synodical conventions, uh, the 7-03 7-03 committee trying to figure out how does Concordia University system relate to all of the universities. I recognize it's remarkably complex. And one of my favorite uh, leadership kind of axioms today is lead literally means go forth and die. <laughs> go, you're at the front lines, go forth and die. So it's easy It's easy to take shots at anybody who's at a a senior leadership from a senior pastor to a president of a university. And I think a lot of the conversation, again, is connected to the system. And one of my struggles today is I don't believe that there is maximum transparency. And this requires maximum humility in the system, which is uh, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And that's what we're praying for right now, that things that are said in the dark would be said in the light. And I really believe that May is going to help bring some light to this conversation. Uh, So, May, how are you doing, sister? It's good to be with you. I'm well. And you? All right. Yeah, so good. So good. It's an honor. So tell about your I, I gave a little bit of a summary of your role. Uh, but what was your role at uh, CUAA with institutional effectiveness, May? Well, I, as you said, I got there from uh, a career in healthcare. I was originally a clinical psychologist and then wound up in, in healthcare administration. And I had the opportunity to uh, leave where I was working and knew that I wanted to do that. And um, because of an illness in my family, it was an ideal time for my husband or me not to work full time. And I could do that. And I knew Concordia Ann Arbor from the Boar's Head Festival, really fundamentally. And I could tell that I was not their ideal candidate for this job. Uh, And at the same time, I uh, had a lot of skills that I think that they really wanted to bring into the institution. And this was just when the merger was starting to ramp up. And so what I thought at that time in my life is, well, I'll come here and it's it's a fair deal. I know what they need to build, uh, even though I haven't done it in higher ed and I'll stay 
here a year or two. Um, but it was uh, Concordia and Ann Arbor is a very, very special place. And I stayed there until I really retired in 2018. So institutional research or institutional effectiveness and my main Dr. Ferry, by the way, is it was Tammy Ferry, who was the head of institutional mm. research in, in Mequon, um, is basically research that tells the institution where it is, how it compares to other institutions, what its trends look like. It can be researched to identify program development opportunities. And that was something I was very involved in as Ann Arbor has really added a lot of healthcare programs. Uh, Kurt Gilo was the campus executive during a lot of that time. And so I was involved in doing uh, feasibility studies and writing the first uh, proposal to the state of Michigan for the nursing program and, and those sorts of things. Um, and to Wonderful. the extent that I can get to transparency, it's really because there is an enormous amount of data in higher education that is publicly available. So it's possible to see not only your own institution, but to see it in the context of other institutions. Yeah. And we're going to get to that. That's that, wonderful. Yeah. So tell yep. about the, yeah, tell about the early years of the merger and any speculation on what went wrong. Okay. Um, I think the early years of the merger were, um, they were, they were really exhilarating and they were mm -hmm. fun. Um, and then there were days when it seemed like nobody knew what they were doing and they were kind of chaotic. There was just a lot of operational knitting together that had to happen. How do you register students? How do you set up courses? Are the courses different here and there? How do you make them, how do you make them cohere? Um, what those kinds of processes across both campuses, you know, the real infrastructure of any business and certainly a business in higher ed was a, was a, a big focus. Um, at the same, and there was an enormous amount of collaboration and energy that was brought to this. And for the most part, people in uh, Mequon and, and Ann Arbor, not completely because Mequon was bigger and even bigger, bigger then, um, they had counterparts and there was a lot of interaction across, across both campuses. And strategic planning retreats were large. We would all, there was a large number of people who would be there. I felt like, <clears throat> like that was a world that I was privileged to, to be in really until around the time that I left. But it's also true that what began to happen is that, is that some of those counterpart relationships were trimmed a bit, that it seemed maybe like things could be streamlined. And it also seemed that as long as things were running smoothly, maybe things didn't have to be attended to as intensively. And I have to say that there was a tremendous amount of gratitude on the part of Ann Arbor. There was a tremendous amount of work invested in this on the part of people in Mequon. And President President Ferry really was a was an inspiring leader through through this. I can't know what happened, but my speculation goes something like this: there was a turnover in administration, and as human beings, we are not always as good as we might be at um, collaborating across a lot of geography um, or, um, or imagining the complexities that are local elsewhere. And so I, I just am not, I just think that that probably played a role in it, especially with the turnover in the administration. And President Ankerberg uh, had a lot of people like uh, Al Prochnow and Bill Cario who had been at Concordia, Wisconsin, for many, many years as part of his team, but uh, but they they retired not so very long ago, also. Okay, so <laughs> that's that's helpful. Um, what would you say? I mean, people may say, "Wow, May, you've not been connected since 2018." Um, what what kind of gives you the credence? We're we're six years down the line. A lot a lot has taken place since that time. Um, so. What what invites you to kind of get in reinvolved, and why should why should folks listen to your perspective, May? Well, I, I ask myself that very question. <laughs> so, um, I think that I was encouraged to do this because I have a set of skills and a knowledge base 
that isn't necessarily duplicated there are, and, and that I can bring that perspective to this discussion and maybe supplement what other people have had to say. The other part of why is it that I should be listened to after 2018 is really that what I did since February um, is very much what I used to do. When I mentioned that there's a lot of publicly available data in higher education, yeah. I basically accessed that and did the same kind of reports that are, are familiar to me from my years at uh, Ann Arbor. So, um, no, that makes sense. So you, you put a a lot of people have seen the timeline may and and you, you kind of compiled based on your research, that timeline, correct? I did not compile the timeline that, that was a group effort. Um, and I take very little credit for that. Um, what I did do were a number of reports that looked at, um, Ann Arbor's growth, CUW's finances, um, the trends over time, um, those sorts of things. Okay, well, good. Let's get into the growth then. Tell about Ann Arbor's growth, especially in the context of the higher ed ed market, for sure. Okay. So one of the things that's been talked about uh, that shows up in kind of every account of this is is that Ann Arbor saw record enrollment um, and the the argument that uh, Ankerberg made in February was that that enrollment was not the sort that was going to make the institution financially viable. So I had not looked at, at uh, the, gr- the growth, obviously, in a number of years. So what I did was to access um, data from the private nonprofit institutions in Michigan. and. Everyone knows that the last 10 years have been difficult in higher higher education. And there was a kind of subtext in the February town hall that Michigan was not a good place to be in the higher education business. But this is what comes across. In a difficult market, not everything goes down to an equal extent everywhere all at once. It's a much more nuanced picture if you look at things on a more individual level. And there are often gainers and I don't want to say losers, but 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 institutions that lose ground. So in Michigan, in the last 10 years, let's start with the the public sector, which I also looked at. Um, There are um, 15 institutions in Michigan and 12 of them saw declining enrollment. Only one of them, U of M Ann Arbor. Uh, really saw any significant growth. In the private nonprofits in Michigan, there are 28 institutions. 18 of them declined, some of them as much as 74%, uh, which is is just is crushing. Seven of them held more or less steady, and only three of them saw significant growth. Uh, Concordia Ann Arbor was the second with 80% growth. Now, a lot of that growth is a a really very direct consequence of the merger. There's just no question that that was an an, an enormous benefit to the campus. But that growth had continued, and Ann Arbor had developed more healthcare programs and, in fact, had two doctorates. Those tend to be the most profitable programs, the graduate programs, that were slated to really launch in the fall um, and one hopes that they still will in um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. So the bottom line here, just to recap, is CUAA grew in an extremely adverse market in Michigan um, and was poised for more growth because it wasn't stagnant in terms of the program development. So that was one of the first first things that I looked at. And it raises the question... Yeah, I'm sorry. Can we pause right there? This is good. No, no, no. Thank you. Um, We've heard publicly that Dr. Ankerberg, President Ankerberg said that that growth wasn't healthy. What is your perspective to that growth not being healthy? I I think that saying that it's not healthy, um, that one of the themes that recurred in when that point was made, or at least in, in my understanding of it, is that it was partly dependent on athletic teams to support growth. And there are two, uh, sort of two angles about this healthy issue. One is that I think that for people who can't imagine 
that athletic teams could be could be a good part of the um, the, the mission fit the, the ministry of a place like Ann Arbor have never met Lonnie Prees, our athletic director and and his staff and he would actually be a wonderful person I think for you to talk to at some point frankly um, he just did a terrific job um, the other part of it is I think that that saying that really under underestimates the possibility of letting programs like the the doctorates that I just mentioned and some of the more recently implemented healthcare programs come to some kind of maturity. Um, who I just don't I, I don't think that that was given an adequate chance. And in fact, in the presentations in February in the town halls, Ankerberg frankly acknowledged that there were no projections that were part of the, the, the consultant's view of Ann Arbor's finances. No projections uh, in when, when the year that they were talk, talking about had some expenses related to program growth and development. It just seems like a, a, a very inopportune time to pull the plug. Well, that's what everyone was kind of praying for was, hey, more time. Yes. More time for the conversation. We understand this is very complex. Uh, but then, I mean, you fast forward from February to May and now the announcement that the athletic department is closing uh, in 2025 and 26. It, mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard for me to not come to some negative <laughs> conclusions regarding motivation heading into the February town hall and the subsequent town halls. I mean, anytime. So uh, I'm going to mm -hmm. use, I, I'm in a church ministry, right? And it, the church is maybe more simple, but if I go into a ministry, cause we got multi-campuses, right? I go into one of our campus meetings and like, well, we're going to have to kind of reimagine what it is that, that we do here. Um, and, and we're just kind of on the edge of keeping this campus open, just to be quite honest. We're, we're like that campus is very well on the path toward, toward closing. And I remember a lot of people getting up and saying, Hey, would you send your kids to, is this going to be around? Is my program going to be around or athletics going to be around when 70 plus percent of the students are athletic are in, in sports? You know, it's, um, like the writing appeared to be on the, on the wall. This thing had already moved so far down once those announcements were made. And while I'm on while I'm on this kick back in back in February, I found it very strange that the the leader, if you will, one of the main boots in the ground leader, Ryan Peterson, he's not he's not speaking. He's not he's not talking. I I know Ryan very, very well. Ryan's a very good communicator. Like, I'd love to get Ryan's perspective about some things that could move move forward. But he was he was moved on from his position. Um, I think he was actually demoted and then he's uh, subsequently taken a position at Concordia St. Paul. That's it just, it just, it just feels strange. It feels, and I'm, I'm a, like an outsider. Like I'm a bulldog. I'm a, I'm a Concordia steward. I'm a Concordia guy for sure. But like, if, if this were my institution, you know, I'd, I'd invested in, I'm thinking of the, the, the mayor, the, the Meyer family, um, and like millions of dollars being poured into this institution. Mm -hmm. It just seemed, um, too fast. And without all of the appropriate data being, being at hand, again, let's get into finances. And then he, uh, president Ankerberg is throwing out $5 million, you know, deficit. And I think it was even upwards of nine. We're still trying to figure out kind of what's going on with the finances here. And then it gets disclosed at the May meeting that no, really the deficit is, is 2.5 million. And in that meeting, I listened, I listened to that board meeting with 11 brand new board members who had not been trained yet. They're just entering in. Talk about a complex situation for a first time board member. You know, this is uncomfortable. And, and then I hear that it's 2.5 million and there's not this like, wow, you hear, you hear president Davis kind of, okay, well that that's better than we thought. Right. And Oh, by the way, we've raised over 3.5 million in the district. Can we have a conversation about, autonomy and moving toward toward that and now there's no there's no grounds for autonomy so anyway i'm just given like the layman's outsider perspective as i look at the timeline and it just it just feels yucky <laughs> i don't know what other word to to say may so yeah your perspective there 
I, I, I don't know that I, ha- I have information in addition to that, um, based on looking at, at Mequon's financial position, but I don't know that I have a completely different perspective because it felt very much to people like there was not, a, not the same sense of stewardship toward, uh, Ann Arbor that there was toward Mequon, um, that, that it was a new administration, it was a new board, and they maybe wouldn't have done the merger and um, the and and begrudged it. I mean, I, I, I that one of the subtexts that got talked about was a sense that Ann Arbor was um, ungrateful and wanted, you know, wanted, you know, wanted to keep doing what it was doing and have Mequon pay the bills. Ann Arbor was, in fact, never asked to come to the table with any kind of uh, strategizing about financial issues. Um, And I can certainly say that Ann Arbor was extremely grateful for the the benefits and gifts of the merger. I just don't think there was the same sense of stewardship. What, What happened in February also was that this was communicated as if it was a a financial emergency. I'm not going to say financial exigency, which is a a term that has a more kind of formal meaning in higher ed. Um, But that just wasn't borne out when I looked at uh, Mequon's uh, situation compared to to other institutions. Um, So say more there. Yeah, let's go deeper there. Okay. So uh, without getting too much into the weeds here. Uh, the, da- the, the data that I described is collected through the Department of Education with over 6,000 you know, higher education institutions in the country. And it's data, data that covers students and faculty and money and the, uh, degrees that are offered. And, and it's everything. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of variables. And you can download data sets from this very rich resource, which has the acronym IPEDS, Integrated Post-Secondary Educational Statistics. Um, And you can filter it in certain ways. So basically what I said is, show me all the private nonprofit institutions in Wisconsin and Michigan with enrollment less than 10,000 students that at least grant master's degrees and above, above. And then I also added in the other CUS schools, right? And then I took out a few institutions as really being very non-comparable. So I wound up with a, with a set of 39 um, comparison institutions. And within that, uh, CUW, and, and the data, by the way, are a little bit older because the most recent year available is 21-22. Um, but CU, CUW's financial position, if anything, actually sounds a little better now from what I've heard than it was in this data. So mm-hmm. they, they have, I think it was the sixth or seventh largest endowment. Um, and of, and it, of, at, at that time, I think it was a hundred and something million. And I looked at a three-year averages in order to to compute this and bring some stability to the data. Over that three-year period, their earnings on the endowment had been 6.6%. Their spending from the endowment had been 2.1%. So they were not even spending. They weren't going into the principal. Ankerberg talked about the importance of not spending from your endowment as like from your savings account. Of course, there'd be circumstances when you do go into your savings account, but they, they aren't doing, they weren't doing that. They were not spending into the endowment. They weren't even spending the earnings on the endowment. Um, the, their, their long-term debt is low. And in fact, he acknowledged that in the town hall. I guess I would echo what your previous guest said. Um, El, El Procno did not build on debt. <laughs> he was... He was a, a really very, very clear headed about that. And then the real kicker is when I looked at the uh, change in unrestricted net assets, CUWAA, these are the combined institutions, right, was second in the sample of 39. So they had the second highest as a proportion of uh, revenues and returns. 
So there is no there's no reason to think that there is a financial emergency. It is true that they have had a decline in enrollment, but they look well positioned to deal with that and and move forward. So the other question. Why? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So why wouldn't an institution utilize the four percent gap in the endowment earnings? which they're entitled to what what is the justification is it just is it just trying to build up revenue you know rainy day type uh, yeah what what is your what's the rationale behind not spending that well i obviously can't i obviously can't know that um what was discussed at the town hall was that a lot of those assets were restricted but actually a, okay. a, a very very high percentage of them i think around 70 plus are un, are unrestricted assets um so I don't, I don't really know the rationale. I mean, one of one of the things that kind of recurs in the the LCMS space, and in fact was something that Ankerberg mentioned during the down hall town down, down <laughs> the down hall. Yes, I was that right? The town hall. <laughs> it was hall. a downer. Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> was an endowment like Hillsdale's, which I think is just shy of a billion. I think it's like 900 million or something like that. And I guess if you're, if you've got Hillsdale on your mind, nothing seems like enough money. Um, Mm -hmm. But I can't speak to, I can't speak to the rationale for not using that. Um, I, I, I I can't say what they, I can't say what their motives are. I can only talk about the effects of, of their actions, I suppose. Yeah. Well, the endowment at Concordia, I think, I think Pat said something uh, a number of months ago around uh, the other Concordias needing to live off the entirety of their endowment assets just to make a go of it. I think he even talked about my alma mater, Concordia, uh, Nebraska. And Mm -hmm. why would, why would, this merger, I get it's complex, but why wouldn't they live? It just doesn't, again, I'm, I'm getting at the rationale. Other, other Concordias have made different decisions around their endowment. Isn't that right, May? Um, I don't know what decisions the other Concordias have made around their endowments. I can certainly say that the combined endowment of Mequon and Ann Arbor is by far the largest in the system, by far. Um, yeah. And not all of that, and, and my understanding is about 27 million of that is uh, – allocated to Ann Arbor, which of course raises the interesting question in the wake of this decision, donors who are a part of that, what, how is that going to be handled? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. So let's get into the, how we got here a little bit more. I mean, I kind of did a, did a quick pass through a number of the points on the timeline. What did I miss? What else do you want to highlight, May? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Can I go back one? There's one one more oh, thing yes, I, was, I was going to say about, about looking digging into the the, the data, um, the financial data. The other thing that I looked at were just trends to see if the financial data, what I've described is comparing um, Mequon and, and Ann Arbor to these other institutions. But the other thing I wanted to look at is if you look at things over time, what comes across, and the. Uh, amount of debt, amount of long-term debt as a percentage of revenues and returns for uh, Mequon actually is at an almost historic low. It was around 30% in around 2010, and now it's around 18%. And I'm not talking about debt you have to pay this year. I'm talking about long-term debt. So again, debt's very low. I also looked at the value of the endowment. The value of the endowment has done nothing but, but, but climb and during the years of the merger. So this subtext that somehow Ann Arbor was, uh, had eroded Mequon's financial position. It's true that money was spent on Ann Arbor and that was wonderful, but Mequon was not put in some disad- terribly disadvantageous spot as a result of that. So anyway, on, onto, the, onto the timeline and, and so on. So just to summarize, it doesn't appear as if there was as much of a financial crisis. Now, it's a matter of opinion and the narrative, right? But just from an outsider's view, I, I wish more time had been given before a number of these announcements uh, were made and, and that the wider church was, 
more engaged in in the conversation uh, rather than rather than less. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the timeline. It's disappointing. I, I would I would actually argue that it's not a matter of opinion that there was no financial emergency. I mean, I just don't see any data supporting <laughs> that there was a financial emergency. And especially, sure. Sure. especially when Ann Arbor's gap moves from five million to two point five million, um, that actually was a moment of, of hope in all of this, as I'll, I'll get to. But anyway, so the time, so the, the timeline, um, the what was announced March first was that the uh, twenty four twenty five academic year would go on basically as things were. Um, of course, not completely. One expects a certain amount of program review and those kinds of things. But basically, that it would go forward as as it had been, that athletics would be preserved and so on. And that what would be undertaken would be the exploration of a path for autonomy for Ann, Ar- and for Ann Arbor. And that, of course, means finances, accreditation, those sorts of things. And the initial way that this was to be explored was through a number of subcommittees. And the membership of the subcommittees was uh, had some m- members of the board, people from uh, Mequon, and usually one, very occasionally, I think, more representatives from uh, Ann Arbor. What happened pretty quickly is that this became... Uh, not just a non-transparent process, but kind of an opaque process. There were NDAs that were expected, uh, non-disclosure agreements for people participating in these. The rationale given was so that the subcommittees at the end could speak with one voice. But of course, when you're doing something as consequential for so many lives as, as this decision has been, the idea that there isn't going to be more than one voice isn't realistic. Um, one person who refused to sign an NDA was dismissed from, from his subcommittee. Another person resigned from a subcommittee because the emphasis wasn't so much on exploring a path for autonomy for Ann Arbor as it became clear that there were several scenarios under consideration, which included closing the campus with, the, uh, with and selling as much of it as could be sold. And to that end, people were pursuing getting valuations of the, the land. Um, or very radical cuts, the kinds of cuts that would not make make it the CUAA that people had known. So um, in the context of this very dispiriting process, uh, John Berg uh, invited Dave Davis to, to work on a, a, a sort of separate plan. And I went from who's doing John Berg. Who's John Berg? May real quick. Who's John? Oh, Berg? John Berg. John Berg. I'm sorry. Is the president of the board of regents. Great. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this was taken very seriously by the Michigan district and he convened a group to work on this. And without going into too much detail, that was made very difficult by the fact that he, despite this invitation, we couldn't get information shared uh, by Mequon. So our requests for financial information uh, were not responded to. And our attempts to collaborate on the accreditation issues were were largely futile. Um, there was just almost like a communication blackout between the two campuses. So the district did in the end produce a, re- a report. The subcommittees produced their report. And during this whole time, to back to the timeline, in early May, there was a board meeting that you referenced. And that actually, for me personally, was a moment of hope because I thought that even though during the meeting, hearing that the um, gap for Ann Arbor had been cut in half, I thought maybe perhaps on reflection, people would be willing to rethink the path that they were on. Um, and then the the other thing that happened around that time is that is that we were told that the land valuation was much less than people had hoped. So it seemed that that maybe maybe there was a way out of this mess, basically to put it to put it in a nutshell. Um, I guess the other thing that I should have said earlier about the the 
the shortfall for Ann Arbor financially is that this was based on a financial model that I know that, that Dr. Ferry addressed this in his podcast. This really just isn't realistic in, in higher education. But in any, any case, it was less. After that, though, and after that sort of f- flare of hope, it did not seem that anything was going to change. And so when the vote happened in early June, it was a deep, deep disappointment, but it was not it was not a surprise. Um, it just did not seem that there was a willingness to to preserve Ann Arbor. And in truth, I had become personally quite pessimistic about this because unwinding the merger would require considerable goodwill and collaboration over several years. We would have to disentangle the operational infrastructure. Ann Arbor would have to be under an umbrella of accreditation to seek its own accreditation. And it did not seem to me that things were were in such a place with Mequon that that was realistic. And Seeking other collaborations had been ruled out early on. Uh, Dr. Ankerberg did not seem willing to consider doing that. I mean that that was a fascinating point in the in the timeline. Uh, it appears, and I don't know where this information came from, but someone found out that President Matthew Harrison uh, approached Dr. Ankerberg in the the hopes that maybe Concordia St. Paul could come alongside and and partner and. Knowing President Friedrich there, I can see how that could be a, a viable viable option moving forward. But some of the some of the language, I guess, uh, I don't want to, President Ankerberg don't want to look bad, uh, don't want it to work out for uh, Concordia Ann Arbor and Concordia St. Paul leaving Concordia University of Wisconsin with a black eye. I guess that was heard like. That sounds nothing but pride. <laughs> I don't know how else to interpret those those words. Um, yeah, it's just it's just really disheartening. So, what was the um, what was the vote in June for those who are un- unaware? What did the board decide in June? You uh, said the, it was in yeah. the the board. The board ruled out um, Ann Arbor Ann Arbor seeking autonomy and um, basically endorsed. What are still rather unspecified cuts to programs, um, but are clearly going to be very, very consequential cuts to programs after the next academic year. Um, As you said, uh, athletics goes. um, I think that there's a general sense that the healthcare programs would be prioritized. Um, Of course, that that may of course, there may be a lot of athletes in those, in those programs. It, it's kind of a view. It feels like it's a view after this next academic year that the most profitable programs might be kept. But of course, this for many of us doesn't take into consideration that the experience of going to college is a more holistic one. And the connections among the students and the um, traditional undergraduates and athletes may be expensive, but they form a very foundational part of the experience. So it's very difficult to imagine what that would look like or that that would be any kind of of happy outcome. Um, And the specifics from that vote, the specifics for any individual program um, are still being are still being announced and unpacked. And there was a, a, a leak yesterday that after the next academic year, things as uh, fundamental as business undergraduate degrees and education degrees among the undergraduates, which would of course in, include the you know LCMS teacher prep would be gone. Uh, we'll wait and see if that's completely confirmed or not. Um, wow. But it's very, it's, it's a very painful scenarios. Now, I also want to say that in the next year, which is the year that they have said will be substantially the same, um, there are a number of very, very good people, faculty and staff, who are committed to making that as, as good a year for the students as they possibly, possibly can. And, you know, knowing some of them, they will give that their all. I'm sure they will. It's awesome. Awesome, Jesus-loving people who have poured their lives mm-hmm. into, and they're not mm-hmm. going to 
they're not going to stop until they're made to until they're made to stop. And <laughs> yeah, right. it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for me to see, especially with athletics being now removed in 25 into 26, how the undergraduate um life campus life continues there mm -hmm. uh much beyond much beyond next year they said uh in the in the may town hall that projections for enrollment in the undergrad program were like 50 some percent or four, i think it was like 46 percent down <laughs> which is like uh, duh <laughs> i mean after the after everything went down it's like i i don't know that i could send my kids there for a year like and and there's also I, I get it like they're one they're one institution and so there's they're trying to get hey we'll get the athletes over to Concordia Wisconsin and all those efforts there's no nefarious I mean we want the kids to stay in this entity for sure and uh, it's just that President Ankerberg used the language about it's hard to it's hard to differentiate between your two kids it's hard to break down the data between between the two kids this was some of the conversation at the May May meeting mm -hmm. and. And I'm sorry, but if you use that analogy, you're it's like you're choosing one kid and leaving the other kid to fend for themselves and not even not even fend for themselves. Fend for themselves would be autonomy. That'd be great. <laughs> right? That'd be you're, great. You're, you're cho choosing death uh, for that. Now, is there like any any hope like is there any backtracking that could take place anytime you get to this kind of black and white? We've come down this. I really believe there's always there's always hope. One, there's always hope in Jesus. Praise be to God. Yeah, you know, we know we know who owns us and a cattle on a thousand hills moving forward. But man, what would happen if President Ankerberg and others came into the meeting and just kind of said, you know what? Based on some of the data, um, we're we're ready to come back to the table to get creative in in solving this this problem to help the undergrad program continue. Um, again, it just looks like there's going to be no walking that back at this point. It looks like they would love to um, sell the asset, most of the asset, and and help Concordia, Wisconsin, live off that that asset. A anything? I think I'm interpreting where we are at this at this moment correctly. Is that is that fair from your perspective, May? I think that that does feel fair. I mean, I, I want to borrow from your previous uh, guest um, from and say that every I think that a number of us have these surges of what I will call relentless hope. Um, but it also feels like we're in a real um, a very, very sad uh, and I would say tragic place around this at this point. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't see any indications of this being walked back. Um, yeah. And, and I, I also yeah. don't think that the offer that, that treating the students like, well, it's one university, so come to Mequon. There are a lot of pro there are a lot of problems with that. Um, these are mostly Michigan kids with ties, you know, of, you know, family, friends, congregations, et cetera, everything that, that people have in life that are, that are more rooted here. There are also uh, tuition grant programs in Michigan that help a number of our students financially that they would lose if they went out of, out of state. So this has by and large been a very uh, unappealing offer. And the other thing that I would mention is that um, the the requirement, the accredited, the accreditor, the Higher Learning Commission really requires that if you close and discontinue programs and all of those sorts of things that go with radical cuts or closure, you have to offer teach outs and teach outs have to be within a reasonable geographic distance. So it doesn't matter if you can if you say that, well, you know, we own this institution and they're our students, uh, you really can't require them to move seven hours away. Um, are they so when and how uh, reasonable teach outs will be offered remains to be seen. Um, I don't know that I ask uh, questions mm -hmm. around the first financial analysis for folks that just want to go back a bit. And this is uh, when they brought in, they, they kicked out the Cario group, I guess. Right. I know. I don't know. I, I had a Cario friend back in, in college, but they didn't kick them out, I guess. But they weren't invited to the table and they they didn't receive their financial analysis, their projections into the future. And they went after another group like 
that what's behind what's behind that? Because their analysis was, I think, a little bit more reasonable, charitable, hopeful, honest, to be sure. And then they went after another group. Like, can you get behind the curtain there a little bit, May? What's going on? I, I, I in, in a lot of ways, I can't. What the town halls were predicated on the results of a financial analysis that was conducted by third party consultants over a period of two days. Um, now, in my previous career, I was involved in a couple couple of these kinds of results and doing do, doing something in two days with such a complex organization, separating out the data, it, it makes one concerned. Um, but this was also the, also the analysis, which to my knowledge was not widely shared by President Ankerberg, certainly I've never seen it, that had the idea that you have these expenses in higher ed and you pay for them out of these revenues and that that was very strictly interpreted. And that was that was the point that he made that first sent me off back into iPads data researching this because my question was, does any school in the COS live this way? Does even even schools that are doing well in the private non nonprofit sector, do they do they function this way? And the answer is really no, that there are often what he was calling um, operational deficits. And that's when you use the endowment or the earnings from the endowment or donors to make up the difference. And when you're in a mode of building programs, of course, you might have more of those gaps, those shortfalls. Um, so that, that analysis, which was relied upon in February and continued to be relied upon in the report that they published in June, um, was, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people, very, very flawed. And they had to do a lot of work in, in the, in the, I don't know, in the, in the path to destruction, I guess I'll say. <laughs> so, um, again, I'm going to, I'm, I'm a layman in this. I've not been in, in higher ed. Uh, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like I'm looking at a I'm looking at a budget and a certain area department campus is is underperforming. Right. And and then I, uh, <laughs> I I have one of two choices at that point. Right. I'm either. OK, we're going to figure it out and we're going to use all of the resources all of the people, manpower resources to boost up that that department, which I have done numerous times in a church and a school of family of ministries here. We we view ourselves together. We we collaborate. Or or I paint the picture that you're not, you know, you're not living up to it. But the the complex thing here, and I, I have that choice. Like we could close things, we could, we could do things, we could paint a narrative that says, hey, this campus underperforming unless we get performance, right? The the hard thing, the hard thing with this is then you get into the data with President Ankerberg and he has a very hard time like differentiating even even the data. So like he's painted a narrative, but then you get like behind the narrative and he's talking about, well, all of this is really kind of hard to hard to suss out. You can't have it both ways. Like <laughs> it's either it's either you've differentiated it and you've called it what it is and you've moved on a path or if it's harder, well, maybe that's because it's more complex and you should have more time to figure this out. Like, it, that's why people are frustrated right now is you've put all of the blame, if you will, on Concordia Ann Arbor. But like, it's a shared thing. <laughs> it's always been a shared thing since the merger took place. So I don't, man, if you could work it back and just let's, okay, let's see if they can figure it out. Let's see if they can figure it out. And I don't, I just don't, I don't get why it appears as if the plan was made long before, the, I don't know if it's long before, but somewhere when those two financial groups did their analysis, we don't like that analysis. We'd like other analysis. Two days, come in, here it is. Here's the narrative. We're going to do what we can to reimagine, but man, water under the bridge. And it was, it was moving fast and people were swept up into it. Any, anything more? I'm sorry. I'm just trying to bring it into my, my world a bit. And, uh, it's, it's disheartening. Yeah. 
<laughs> I feel like I've said that numerous times, man. <laughs> no, in, in everything that you said just now, though, what, what really comes across is you have to want it. You have to want it to work to start to start with. You have to be motivated to figure it out. And I, I can't know motivations here. I said I can really only see effects, but I, I have speculated that one of the motivations is it's there's there's no money in the world enough if if really you want to have a Lutheran Hillsdale, which is one of the concerns concerns that a number of people have. That's not any original thought on my part. Um, and the other part of it is that this wasn't an administration that would have done the merger in the first place. So they wanted to undo the merger and maybe be paid back for it, even though that all occurred on someone else's on someone else's watch. And I think that there was and I can't know this either, but it seems, it feels like there was a, a, a fantasy because this is a fantasy that, that this decision could solve the problem of Ann Arbor, um, that Ann Arbor wouldn't still be there with all of the students and the families and the alumni and the donors and the buildings that need to be maintained and, and all of those entanglements. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, here, here we are, we have this decision, but all of that is still there. Uh, the, 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 I don't think that the Board of Regents really simplified their, their lives with this decision. But they certainly changed a lot of lives, a, a lot of lives at CUAA. To be sure, and this is a different, this is a different story than Concordia, Bronxville, like Selma, mm -hmm. Portland. Um, it's complex, obviously, because there was a merger like Concordia Ann Arbor likely doesn't exist even today. Another, you know, decade plus of ministry apart from collaboration and trying mm -hmm. to trying to figure it out. Um, but what I can see, it wasn't as dire as as was painted. So um, let's let's close with this. Thank you for your generosity of time. Mm -hmm. um, Concordia University system and individual Concordias. What can they kind of learn from this? May. Oh, um, I I don't know. I mean, I I, I it, it feels to me that there is a profound divide between people who would like to preserve the, the higher ed institutions um, in the system and people who would be content to see it shrink and, and kind of consolidate the assets from that. And it feels to me like that, that tension swirled all around the situation in Ann Arbor and resulted in really, uh, if there was any synodical intervention that, that might have been helpful, it certainly isn't anything that I saw. Um, if there was anything from the CUS, uh, it, it felt like they were bystanders from where, from where I have been in this. And I certainly haven't been in a lot of the conversations within the LCMS, but I've been pretty close to, to the action. Um, as I understand it, if there are changes in the other boards of regents in the next few years, they're likely to go in the direction that the changes in the board of regents went in Mequon. Um, it is, it, I believe that that's, that that's correct. And, and what was that direction, May? What was that direction in Mequon? Yeah. Well, this very new board um, and with arguably much less experience of higher ed than the boards they replaced. So I do not... Um, I guess I'll just say this very directly. I would be very anxious if I were the administrators or boards of the other institutions. Um, a CUAA is defined as a branch campus of Mequon at this point, but it had a long, long history since the 1960s as being a part of the system. And um, it, it in the end, was really treated as, you know, as, as property, as an, as an asset to be done with whatever the, the Board of Regents decided. That's how it feels. 
and Again. the students and the students uh, and their families are paying the price. I mean, every time somebody has to transfer in higher ed, they run the risk of not completing their degree. Uh, it costs them more money to lose the time. Uh, there are responsibilities in for institutions that kind of pull the rug out from under their students like this. And I think that that is a story that that is going to continue to unfold. Hmm. Well, this is why there was a lot of conversation around 703 Concordia University system, um, because there's just not a lot of trust in our system right now. Um, and I don't know that there's maximum transparency. I, I, I don't know if anything came down from, you know, the CUS group about this. I don't know how they were engaging with Dr. Ankerberg and, um, all, all I know is <laughs> the, the, we've talked about the prior approval list here, and I think that's kind of what you were you were uh, stating is um, controlling that prior approval list in terms of who gets on the board of regents in these. That's a very, very powerful lever that comes from the president of Synod's office. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we've been engaging all of all of the brain trust, if you will. Uh, within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, I, I pray there's a there's a lot of folks that probably will listen to this, and you know, I'm sure they'll have lots of opinions, and that that's just fine. Um, we have a lot we have a lot to learn, and humility is the path forward. Bringing what is in the dark into the light. I hear non disclosure agreements. Like if I'd have to go down a path with that as a local parish pastor, I mean that would just just feels like what are we what are we doing? Like mm -hmm. conflict is necessary disagreement is necessary. I get sharpened by people that have a diverse perspective, but it's, it's just, uh, we're not, we're not managing right now, at least collectively difficult conversations as well as we could. And I pray will into the future within the Lutheran church, Missouri synod. And some people have said, you know, is the, the mantle of God's like grace leaving this? I, I pray not. I pray conversations like this. I, I've tried May. I'm trying to be charitable and and kind. Again, leadership is very difficult. Dr. Ankerberg, praying for you. Um, I'm praying for reconciliation of relationships. It's just been it's just been very difficult. And kind of kind of closing comment from you, May. Um, I'm just glad you're you're involved. Thanks for staying connected. You put a lot of time into that institution maybe oh this would maybe be a good good closer uh that was your experience there at concordia ann arbor it was very evident that it was a lutheran institution right that this was a this was a you didn't come from a lutheran background per se but your experience of grace and scripture and the love of christ christ alone etc like i know a lot of leaders that were there obviously pad ferry it was still a very lutheran institution lutheran experience say more say more there may i just don't think that there's any question about that or about the the depth of the commitment to that and one of the thing one of the things that i've wondered about that may or may not be accurate is that it's Concordia Ann Arbor. And so Ann Arbor as a city has this very liberal, liberal secular reputation, correct? Yeah. And so I wonder if people far away from CUAA think that um, it is nestled in the home of hippies in the hash bash. And so it cannot be a Lutheran institution. And uh, I just, I, I don't know how to, counter that except to say you you have to know these people you have to be there um and and the the commitment to that was evident all the time you know the leaders the leaders on that campus and i just i think that it's such a, a tragedy to assume that we know so much about people who are far away and that we we judge and in such uncharitable ways and want to remake everything in our own image. It feels like that's that's not the that's not where that energy should be directed. And especially when there are mis there are misunderstandings about that. 
May, you're a, a delightful follower of Jesus. Um, I've had a good time getting to know you, but I'll be honest, I have not had a fun time talking about this. It's <laughs> I'd much rather talk about other things, man. This is so messy. So thanks for engaging the mess. It requires a certain level of, of courage and um, just being willing to talk about me kind of in the court of public opinion. I think you've said if you go to, if people want to follow the the Facebook group, what is that group right now? I hardly get on Facebook at all, May. Yeah. So the Facebook group is Concordia Matters and uh, the reports that I mentioned, the timeline that you mentioned, all of those things are posted uh, there. And um, that, so that's, that's a source of information. I mean, it's hard to get, it's hard to get the story out. And I know, I know that this is frustrating to people in Mequon. But the reality is that as depressing as June 7th was, as much as it seemed like, well, we lost. So that part of this is over again. There it's the university is still there. The students are still there. The families are still there. The struggle about what to do in the aftermath of this is all still there. So the engagement continues. I mean, you, it, you, you can't you can't wish all that out of existence that it's painful and true. And so that's where we'll be. That is where we'll be. Bring athletics back, Dr. Ankerberg. It took, I, I, that makes me sad. I'm a former athlete, bulldog athlete. Like, yeah, like the closure of that. Could we walk that one back? That'd be a good start. And mm-hmm. then he maybe start toward separation over multiple years. It's still it, choosing the path of humility could still be a viable, a viable option from what I and again, Dr. Ankerberg and others, you would probably disagree because you have different information. Um just I'd love to for you to disclose as much as you possibly can as as things move forward. That is that is our prayer. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. This is lead time. Sharing is caring. Like, subscribe, comment wherever it is you take in these these podcasts. Uh, we we kind of we kind of have a commitment to talk about harder things, and uh, this is this is one of those examples. So thank you, May. You're a gift to the body of Christ. Thank you, Tim. My pleasure. You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC's mission is to collaborate with the local church to discover, develop, and deploy leaders through biblical Lutheran doctrine and innovative methods. To partner with us in this gospel message, subscribe to our channel, then go to the uniteleadership.org to create your free login for exclusive material and resources, and then to explore ways in which you can sponsor an episode. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.